Hello, my name is Steve Manlove. I'm a psychiatrist in Rapid City, South Dakota. And I've been thinking about psychiatry, where it's going, where it's been. Um, and I, I'm going to do a little presentation on that today to share my thoughts. Um, the, the purpose is to get some cross-pollination going, to get other people thinking about these things and um, looking for feedback, looking for new ideas, because we need more ideas. We've gotten stuck in old ideas. So, so let's just start by talking about the past of psychiatry a little bit. The first, uh, you know, the, the beginning of psychiatry in the modern era was really uh, Sigmund Freud. And this slide says, psychiatry is the art of teaching people how to stand on their own feet while reclining on couches. Uh, a famous Sigmund Freud quote, or at least one that's attributed to him. But Freud was, you know, a genius, one of the most important intellectual figures of the, of the 20th century. And his main, his biggest, his biggest uh, breakthrough from my perspective was identifying that there's unconscious things that are going on in our minds that we're not aware of. He's, he began a process of uh, psychotherapy that has evolved over time. And I'm going to show you some examples of some different kinds of psychotherapies as they've evolved. This uh, slide says, uh, in my dream I catch the car and the driver turns out to be a cat. I chase him up a tree, steal the car, then run down, run over the postman. So this would be an example of psychoanalysis, right? This uh, slide shows, uh, says, nervous little dogs face their fears at an anxiety management seminar. This would be an example of exposure therapy. In this cartoon, it says, are you aware that what you said, or that when you said that, your tail went between your legs? And this is an example of gestalt therapy, being in a moment with your feelings. This cartoon says, and for the, and for future reference, Mr. Glenn, you don't need to get in character for regression therapy. So this would be an example of regression therapy. Uh, this is a little cartoon about a borderline personality disorder. I prefer not to think of myself as having borderline personality disorder. I prefer to think of it as being really awesome and letting everyone know through outbursts of emotion. So how do we treat that? This, this is a slide that gives an example of that. It says, today I will live in the moment, unless the moment is unpleasant, in which case I will eat a cookie. Uh, this would be an example of uh, dialectical behavioral therapy that we use to treat borderline personality disorders. And here's an example of scream therapy. It's a person in the emergency room and the statement says, uh, it's our new method for determining who we should treat first. We take the people in order of how loud they scream. Another example of exposure therapy, Professor Gallagher and his controversial technique of simultaneously confronting the fear of heights, snakes, and the dark. Now we move into a little bit more uh, newer kinds of therapy, including marital therapy. And this... Uh, cartoon, it says, he's handsome, sincere, generous, intelligent, supportive, patient, successful, romantic, strong, funny, energetic, thoughtful, sensitive, and kind. But sometimes he leaves the camp off the toothpaste. Does that sound familiar to anybody? And then there's family therapy. Now, this is a family of rabbits. They're very complex families, as you might guess. Um, but uh, they're looking at a family tree. So while this uh, development of psychotherapy was going on, there was also some biological therapies that were, that were in, uh, in process. And these kind of began in the early 1900s, the early 20th century. And they tried a variety of you know, ways of kind of changing the brain to, to try to treat psychiatric illness. Uh, one of the first ones was malaria-induced fever, which was used to treat neurosyphilitic paresis in 1917. Uh, then they used insulin-induced coma and convulsions to treat schizophrenia in around 1927. When I was a resident, I had a, a psychoanalyst uh, a mentor who told me about doing insulin shock therapy, and he said they would make people go into a coma, and then they would slowly bring them out, and he said you would, the, the, the doctor would sit on the edge of the bed and feed them jam as they were coming out of their coma. 
and they would sort of have this rebirth experience with the psychiatrist as sort of the feeding them and taking care of them. And apparently there was some therapeutic uh, benefit from it. Uh, later they developed met metrazole induced convulsions to treat schizophrenia and affective disease. The problem with metrazole was that they couldn't stop the convulsions sometimes. It was not, you know, wasn't us. People continued to have convulsions afterwards and that created some of its own issues. And then electro electroconvulsive um, shock therapy was discovered by Ugo Cerletti and Lucio Bini in Rome in 1937. And that was when really neurostimulation really caught a toehold. Uh, that was, as you know, right during the beginning of World War II. Um, it was, um, and as people came out of World War II when it ended, there were lots of veterans who had lots of psychiatric problems. And there were really no treatments for them in the 1940s except electroconvulsive therapy. So if you talk to psychiatrists who uh, were practicing in those days, if they weren't doing psychoanalysis, many of them were doing electroconvulsive therapy. And I, I, know I have one friend who's a psychiatrist who's about 99 years old now who told me that during the 1940s he did 15,000 electroconvulsive therapy treatments in, uh, in uh, Omaha. So again, this just is a picture of Ugo Cerletti who started uh, uh, electroconvulsive therapy. And electroconvulsive therapy, they used, actually induced elect introduced electricity into the brain to trigger a seizure, and that's how it worked. Well, this is an example of a more modern uh, view of electroconvulsive therapy. It's, it's very safe, very effective, but it has some morbidity associated with it, including memory problems. Uh, and, uh, and, the, and, and, and it also, um, also is complicated to do. You have to give it people anesthesia. Uh, you, you need to have it done in a, in a controlled, very controlled environment for it to be safe. So how about medications? You know, it seems like we've had medications forever, but actually that's not true. Um, the first medication for psychiatric problems was developed in the early 1950s. It was Thorazine. It was the first drug used to treat psychosis. It, it, uh, they were trying to develop an antihistamine, and they developed this Thorazine, which not only had some antihistaminic properties, but it also treated psychosis. When, when Thorazine was developed, in those days, people who had chronic mental illnesses lived in state hospitals. There were these huge state hospitals all around the country that had um, several thousand people in each of them. And they were little communities of mentally ill people. Uh, Thorazine, when it was developed, the psychiatrists who were using it then, they, they thought they were going to lose their jobs because everybody got better, it seemed. And people were just walking out of the mental uh, hospitals because they no longer were psychotic. So here's an advertisement for Thorazine. Keep, helps keep your patients out of mental hospitals. Um, another one, uh, you know, they, they began to use it for everything because they didn't have anything else. But, uh, doctor, what can you do for pop? <laughs> so for an obstreperous uh, older person, Thorazine was a godsend. And then how about the oppositional kid in the child with a behavioral disorder? This is take Thorazine. You know, now we don't even use Thorazine very much anymore. I mean, it's just very rarely we use it. Uh, here's another one. It looks like Thorazine is used to keep people from dancing. <laughs> it actually, you know, is trying to uh, depict agitated people that Thorazine helps. Around the time that uh, the Thorazine was being developed, there was, a, there was a medicine that was developed to treat hypertension that was called reserping. And this guy, Robert Wilkins, was studying that, and he noticed that Reserpine had remarkable effectiveness for the management of hypertension, but also had mental status changes that calmed people down. Uh, somebody said, I haven't felt this good for years. Nothing bothers me anymore. So that got people's attention, and they began to think about, are there medicines that could, could do that, that are related to reserpine, or maybe reserpine itself? It turned out that reserpine, though it did have a calming effect, it paradoxically also caused depression. So. That was a reason that they stopped using it for the most part. Um, 
But it, but because it did help, and, and the way it worked for hypertension was that it affected monoamine neurotransmitters. It generated a hypothesis that maybe other medicines that affected these monoamine neurotransmitters like serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, which are almost household words now, um, might be able to be affected by some kinds of medications. So what are the three monoamine neurotransmitters that affect mood? And I just told you, uh, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. And where do they come from? This is a slide that shows that these monoamine neurotransmitters actually, actually come from nuclei in the brainstem. And, and they're projections from the brainstem into the frontal lobes and all through the brain that are, um, that are projections from these nuclei and, and distributing serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine around the brain. And that's how we think that the that antidepressants ultimately work is not just by stimulating the release of monoamine neurotransmitters from cells in, in specific parts of the brain, but, but from these nuclei in the base, in, in the uh, in the brainstem. Um, around the time they were thinking about reserping, there was a, a, you know, I mentioned the deinstitutionalization of psychiatric patients. There was another deinstitutionalization that was going on back in the, in the 1940s and early 50s. And that was the deinstitutionalization of the tuberculosis asylums. You know, back before 19, the 1940s, they didn't have any medicines to treat tuberculosis with. So people would go to asylums and they would just wait until their body either fought off the illness or they died. Um, there still are some asylums around the country that you can visit, but they're really of only historical interest. In the 1940s, in, in that time frame, they developed a series of drugs that you could treat tuberculosis with. And one of those was called epraniazide. And epraniazide helped tuberculosis, but they serendipitously observed that it helped depression also. So people who had TB who were depressed, not only their, their TB get better, but their depression improved. So they began to wonder if medicines like epraniazide might help depression. And that, uh, that led to the development of um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which epraniazide was the first of, or one of the first of. And this just kind of shows uh, some of those, those medications and where they came from around when they came. So isoniazide in 1952 and 53, and ipronizide, which were monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And then later on in the 50s, the tricyclic antidepressants were developed, which were imipramine and amitriptyline. And these were the medicines that really um, I grew up with. I, I did my residency in 1982 to 1987. Those are the only, those are the medicines we use for depression then. We had that and electroconvulsive therapy. And these were fairly dirty medicines, meaning they had quite a few side effects. So you needed to have a, you know, needed to really need to treat it in order to put people through the toxicity that these medications uh, brought with them. Imipramine was one of the first tricyclics discovered in 1951. Again, it was an antihistamine. They thought they were developing and it turned out to be a major tranquilizer um, and, and really help depression more than, than psychosis. And it's a norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake inhibitor, so it elevates those in the brain. And then in about 1990, this was in my life when I was just starting my practice, um, Prozac came out. And Prozac really changed the landscape of, of prescribing medicines for psychiatry. I mean, Prozac um, just didn't seem to have any side effects compared to the other medicines. And uh, it was rapidly the most commonly prescribed drug in the United States. Within a few years, it was the most commonly prescribed drug in the United States. And it, it, was, it, was, hel it was helpful, it worked well. Uh, and it worked just by inhibiting serotonin reuptake, so it was much, uh, had fewer side effects than the other medications had. And, um, and so we had found the happiness store when we found Prozac. Uh, this, this cartoon says, his few friends had told him he could never buy it, but Mr. Crowley surmised that they just didn't know where the store was. And this seemed to be where the store was, it was the Prozac store. But, you know, Prozac didn't turn out to be perfect either. 
Um, now, so that's around 1990 that Prozac was developed. And around 1985, a few years earlier, this guy named Anthony Barker began to play around with using electromagnetic fields to stimulate neuronal conduction. And that was the beginning of transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a, a, an event that ultimately has really changed psychiatry and, and I think we need to pay attention to this because I think this is where psychiatry may be going over the next decade as we get better and better at us, utilizing this for focal treatments of different brain disorders, not just, not just in psychiatric disorders. This is an example of a TMS machine. Um, there are other places that you can see lectures just on TMS, so I'm not going to go into that in depth, but um, suffice to say that, that it became an important part of our practice when once it was FDA approved in 2008 and, and we began to have different options for or strategies for using it. While this is going on, there's this other thing happening uh, that I'm calling psychiatric genetics. As you know, um, in the 1990s and ending in 2003, uh, there, the Human Genome Project was going on and it com was completed in 2003. So we had this vast amount of genetic information that we've been sifting through ever since then. And that is another thing that is really beginning to inform how we make decisions and will inform that more and more over the next decade. So we, we did uh, DNA analysis and now we're trying to figure out how to analyze the DNA analysis. God, the human genome code's been unraveled. And God says, damn hackers, now I have to change the password. So one of the examples of what the Human Genome Project has shown us is, and, 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 and genetic studies for, for mental health are that there's a, a gene called the MTHFR, or methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase gene that makes an enzyme called methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. And there's a meaningful percentage of the population that is deficient in that. And if you look at people with treatment-resistant depression, uh, it's a much, much higher percentage. In, in our study, in our clinic, it's around 70 or 80 percent of our patients are deficient in that. And finding that out is important because we can bypass the, the gene that's absent and give people methylated folate to to address that issue. And, and we believe that that is one of several things that is helping our patients do better than they were before. This is just an example of, of what, what happens with um, you know, folic acid and, and what's missing when you have that MTHFR gene being abnormal. Um, folic acid, which you get in most, in most uh, fo many foods and that you can get by vitamins too, uh, is, 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 is methylated by the MTHFR enzyme and creates what's called methylated folate or methylfolate. And methylfolate is the active form. Folic acid itself doesn't do much. Methylfolate is what you need. So if you don't have that gene that turns folic acid into methylfolate, then you're not getting, you don't have the full complement of methylfolate that you need because methylfolate is important for making neurotransmitters serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine. So it's like if you don't have as much methylfolate as you really need, it's like having a well and having a pipe in a well to pump water out. And if you've got six inches, you can get some water, but you're going you're gonna to very quickly be pumping air. If the pipe is down six feet into the water, then you're going to get a bunch of water and you're not going to pump air very quick. If you don't have much methylfolate, you're pumping air fast when you're, when you're trying to make more of these neurotransmitters. And this just shows that um, if you don't have the gene, you don't get methylated folate. Um, I'm going to skip over this one. I pretty much described this already. So, so this is that, you know, that's kind of the past of psychiatry in a, in a brief synopsis. <laughs> Um, but, but some highlights, anyways. Um, you can see that there's been, you know, phenomenal improvement. I mean, where would we be if we didn't have anything to treat 
people with psychosis. I mean, we'd still have these thousands of people in these in these hospitals. Uh, the unfortunate part is all these medicines have caused side effects. And so, for instance, why we don't use Thorazine much anymore is because it made people um, have all these uh, anticholinergic side effects like dry mouth and sedation and weight gain. And it also caused heart eye dyskinesia. So you, you fix a problem, but you create other problems. And so what, what, what we're hoping is that in the next decade, we'll find more specific treatments that don't create so many problems when we're treating illnesses. So in, in my mind, I, I, I kind of walked through this process of, of over the past few years of kind of trying to trying to develop a practice that will begin to utilize some of these strategies. So, um, you know, just to tell you a story, um, uh, oh, about uh, five years ago, I, I'm, uh, I began to think, yeah, what, you know, I, what I'm doing is okay. Um, we're helping some people. We're not helping other people. But, you know, I, I really am frustrated with this process of basically 30% of people with depression not being treatable using the strategies that we used, which were medications. And I've been watching the TMS literature and seeing different products come out, and I finally got excited enough to try getting a machine. So we got a TMS machine in, in 2015. Um, we started using it, and we, we had really great results very quickly. And this, were, this was in people who we, we knew statistically had a very small chance of responding to antidepressant medications. What I noticed almost immediately within the first couple of months of treating these people with TMS was that, uh, that people who exercised while they were doing TMS or contemporaneously with the TMS seemed to do better. And I thought, well, okay, so maybe they're feeling better, so they're now willing to exercise, or they're, they're, they're activated enough to exercise, or maybe the exercise is helping the TMS work better. And so I began to do some literature search on exercise and what it does to your brain. And I found that um, exercise increases a hormone called brain-derived neurotrophic factor or brain-derived gr uh, brain growth or neuron growth factor. So this actually stimulates brain growth. One of the theories about TMS is that TMS also stimulates brain growth. And so I thought, aha, there's some synergy. Exercise stimulates the release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. TMS stimulates brain growth, maybe. Uh, maybe the combination gives a synergistically a better response. This is a slide that just kind of shows something about uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So you can see up in the left-hand corner, exercise is one of the things that triggers the release, but also dietary energy restriction. So a key, a key, ketogenic type diets where you restrict um, sugar and simple carbohydrates. And then cognitive challenges can also stimulate brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And brain-derived neurotrophic factor goes to the several areas all over the body, really, but specifically the hypothalamus and the hippocampus, the uh, autonomic nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, and makes them all work better, basically. And why does that happen? Um, we think that Exercise triggers the release of uh, uh, a chemical in your liver called beta-hydroxybutyrate butyrate, or beta-hydroxybutyric acid. That gets into the bloodstream, that goes to different parts of the brain, and through a, uh, it's metabolized through some histones and it causes expression of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So that's exciting. So then what does brain-derived neurotrophic factor do on a chemical level, on a cellular level? There's some studies that suggest that what brain-derived neurotrophic factor does is it makes cholesterol, which is you know all through your body, and you need to have cholesterol in your body, um, and it stimulates synapse formation. So we think that brain-derived neurotrophic factor at least stimulates synaptoblastic activity, that is, making synapses. And we, we want your brain to have a robust... Um, activity in both both synaptoplastic making synapses and synaptoclastic, which is 
uh, reducing synapses so that, that your brain will adapt to your environment by doing those things. So, so uh, knowing that, you know you should get out and exercise regularly because you want your brain to be dynamic and plastic. So, okay, so brain drive neurotrophic factor, exercise, that, that seemed like an important factor. Um, what, you know, then the question, the next obvious question was what else might improve brain growth, improve brain dynamics, improve neuroplasticity, um, make your brain function better so that you either don't get depression or you, and you don't get dementia, you don't get brain diseases as easily, or that so that you can be treated more easily when you do get them. Um, so, you know, that led to a sifting through the scientific literature, because this really isn't much in the medical literature, uh, on what can stimulate brain growth and brain, brain plasticity. And uh, in doing that, uh, you know, I, I got into the dementia literature, that's where a lot of the uh, research is being done, and found lots of different uh, uh, factors that, that, that can affect brain plasticity and brain growth. Um, I also found that you know, after 30 years of trying to treat Alzheimer's disease, after the disease had established itself, virtually no progress had been made. So there was an argument that I, that I began to look at from this dementia literature that um, we need to be thinking about preventing illness rather than waiting till you get an illness. So um, really it doesn't look like you can, we can treat dementia, but we can maybe prevent it. And de depression is also possibly a disease of poor neuroplasticity. And if we can enhance neuroplasticity, not only may we prevent it, but we may make it easier to treat. And that's what I think that we've seen in our data, which I'm going to show you in just a minute. Um, so what we, we began to do in our office was we did a combination of trained cranial magnetic stimulation and, and brain health. And we would assess brain health by looking at people's behavior and their symptoms, that sort of thing, but then doing a broad laboratory panel looking for biomarkers suggestive of you know, factors that might cause poor brain health. And we found that in the population that we did TMS on, we were finding lots of abnormal biomarkers. Uh, and, and they varied from person to person. We checked about 50 different variables, and uh, we, we found that compared to the general population, this population had many more abnormalities. Things like uh, zinc deficiency, or things like uh, elevated homocysteine levels, or metabolic syndrome, or uh, subtle kinds of hypothyroidism, or adrenal problems. And, w and we believe that when we addressed all those problems, and then did TMS, we had possibly better results, both in response rate and in lack of recid or less recidivism than possible, you know, my, than, than maybe we're seeing in the general community. So this is an example. Um, in, in some large studies, this has been kind of the, the response rates to TMS. 56.4 partial response, that would be like a 50% drop in their depression scale and a 28.7% remission rate. Now I know lots of clinics are doing better than that and they're probably doing things kind of like what we're doing or maybe different things too. Um, this is just a slide that shows those numbers in a bar graph presentation. Uh, it's, I'm really interested in the patient rating because it, what, what I think they're doing, who cares, you know? I mean, really what matters is what the patient, how they think they're doing. So this was our data um, in the first 43 people we treated for the first two years of our um, TMS treatment. Uh, we treated uh, uh, 43 people. They were all severely depressed based on their scores on either the PHQ-9 or the MADRAS. And all had failed at least five antidepressants. Some had failed as many as 20 antidepressant trials. So lots of, uh, lots of tries, not very many hits. Our results were uh, 31 out of the 43%, or 43 people, or 72%, had a greater than 50% drop on their uh, depression scale, which is pretty good. And then 15 of the 43, or 35%, reported complete remission based on their rating scales. 
So, uh, you know, a little better than what I've shown you in the, 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 bigger, the bigger studies. Uh, not necessarily better than other clinics are doing, but um, I, I think there was a, there's a message related to the brain health issue. Uh, I, I think that that may have been what made the difference. I think, I don't have our data on recidivism yet, but our recidivism rate has been much lower than we would see if we were treating people with antidepressants. Uh, when people who respond well to antidepressants uh, have something like a 50% re recidivism rate within the, the year, We've been, we're, we're right around 20% recidivism rate uh, who need, you know, another course of TMS. So much better than meds. Maybe related to the brain health stuff. And, and if, if, if we're doing nothing else with the brain health stuff, we're making people healthier. And we're, we're reducing their likelihood of other neurodegenerative or just degenerative health problems. Because when we treat brain health, we're actually all treating the whole body health. There's, there's really very little difference between what you do. This just compares us versus large studies. I showed you this before. We think our, our data is a little bit better than the, than the large studies. Not, you know, not dramatically better, but maybe better enough to at least make you wonder if it might not be being helped by something else we're doing, which in our case, it seems to be brain health. So another, another story. Um, in the past year, I, I had the opportunity to have uh, to go to the Mayo Clinic. My wife had a, a, a health problem that required uh, some intervention. She had melanoma that was a, it was a skin cancer, and, and uh, she needed surgery. We went to the Mayo Clinic, which is sort of the, you know, one of the classic medical model places. And um, we got great care. You know, everything turned out fine. It was all wonderful. Um, using standard medical model strategies. Um, when we were done, we talked to the doctors who were running this and said, they you know, reported that we'd gotten everything, and everything was good. And the next question my wife asked was, well, okay, so now how do I prevent it from happening again? And they said, well, you know, skin cream and stay out of the sun. Okay, yeah, we know that. I mean, that's, that's pretty common knowledge, but what else can we do? Well, there's really nothing else that helps. And that's what they told us. And so, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, no, I, I, I know that um, cancer is to some degree a disease of the um, immune system. Your immune system is no longer getting rid of cancer cells and they proliferate and you get what we call cancer. We always are paring out cancer cells from our body and keeping that from occurring. So something is not going right in your immune system when you develop cancer, at least hypothetically that's the case. And this, this is really first year medical school information. This is, this is not uh, something that you need to be, you know, a scientist to understand. But they didn't, you know, they didn't mention that. And so I, I, I wonder why didn't they talk about that or talk about ways that you might improve your immune system so you could prevent maybe a melanoma or some other cancer occurring. And it struck me that, you know, despite, you know, that they had a different way of thinking about medical information. Um, they they had they they had a high they, they wanted a high degree of proof that something would be helpful before they would suggest it to you. Thus, I think they didn't feel that they had a high enough level of proof that other things could be helpful, and that therefore they wouldn't share it with us. Um, so they so they were missing out on some thoughts about how you prevent disease. As I mentioned, you know we know that cancer is to some degree a disease of the immune system. And uh, this is a, 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 a pyramid that looks at uh, different kinds of studies and levels of certainty. So the highest level of certainty is systemic review meta-analyses. Lower level is expert opinion. And what, what I think that I was reading between the lines when we talked with the docs there was that the information about uh, improving your immune response to help prevent cancer was not a high enough level of certainty for them to recommend it to other people. 
And I thought, well, that's that's good. I mean, I, I understand that you don't want to recommend things, especially dangerous things, to people that might not uh, that might that that could be helpful to them, but you're not you don't have a high level of certainty. But how about things that aren't dangerous to you? So, if an intervention is dangerous, like toxic chemotherapy, a high degree of proof is needed before recommending the intervention, right? If an intervention is not dangerous, like vitamin D to improve one's immune system, just as an example, a lower level of proof may be sufficient before recommending it. And I, and I think this is a problem that the medical community has. We are locked into this high level of proof before we're suggesting people do things which are really benign to prevent illness. So that, so that made me begin to think about more about medicine in the future and psychiatry, mental health in the future. Um, around that time, this was in August of 2017, a guy named Dale Bredesen came out of, with a book called The End of Alzheimer's, which showed that prevention can work in treating Alzheimer's disease. By he, he, Dale Bredesen was one of the people who did a lot of that research on dementia that I was mentioning, he and other people. He compiled this in a book and said, and, and, and began to do studies looking at if you address all these biomarkers that are off, could you prevent dementia? and he found good results. So the question arose, might we not be, or should we not be doing that with other illnesses? Certainly with brain illnesses, but also with other illnesses all through the medical community. Should we be working more on prevention rather than waiting for people to get the disease and then just doing disease treatment? So I began to think of the medical community the way, and the way we think about things as being a three-legged stool that's missing one of the legs. The two legs that we have that are, are pretty good, and we certainly wouldn't want to do without, are treatment of disease once it occurs, and more dramatic interventions for disease like surgery, or uh, electroconvulsive therapy, or transcranial magnetic stimulation. We're, we're getting better at those things. There, there's still progress to be made, of course. But we're not doing the third leg, which is prevention. And it turns out, uh, and from my perspective that when you, even when people have a disease, if you begin to work on prevention or the, the preventive kinds of strategies, you make the disease more treatable. We know that, for instance, in, let's just say, a person with COPD. They've got COPD, they've already got the illness. Uh, we know that if you take that person with COPD and get them into an exercise routine, which would be a standard preventative kind of strategy, and stop smoking, you can make their disease more easily treated, right? So I mean, there's good data about that. So, um, so prevention isn't just when you're, you know, when, before they're sick, it's also a strategy you can use to enhance current treatment, okay? So my vision of the medical system, psychiatric treatment of mental illness in the next decade is that we work on developing the three-legged stool, that we we enhance uh, our our psychotherapeutic or psychopharmacological approaches. We get better at our interventions with TMS, ECT, other neurostimulating strategies that can actually treat brain illnesses without causing systemic side effects, and that we add prevention to the process. Um, so that's kind of where, you know, kind of a synopsis of where I think we need to be going. And I'm going to describe a little bit more about that uh, in the next part of this talk. So again, the three legs, disease treatment using medication, psychotherapy, disease intervention, procedures such as surgery, TMS, ECT, and then disease prevention using genetic markers and biomarkers to begin to assess when a person is developing a disease and trying to stop it before it gets out of control. Um, I wouldn't want to get rid of disease intervention. <laughs> um, when I uh, have a serious infection, I want to take antibiotics under the right circumstances. Um, so they're great, you know, 
antipsychotics have really helped people with psychotic illnesses. Obviously, insulin has saved countless lives. We have, people who have diabetes. And the list goes on. Uh, disease treatment using psychotherapy. It's helped people gain insight into their behaviors. Enhances functionality of the frontal lobes. It's very helpful for people. So I'm not, I'm not putting down what it, medicine is doing. I just want to add a third leg. Uh, disease interventions like surgery, like my wife's cancer, was cured with surgery. I, I like that. Uh, stent placement. When, when I have a heart attack, I, I don't want you to talk to me about prevention. I, I want a stent placed or a surgery done. Um, transcranial magnetic stimulation or ECT. When somebody's severely depressed um, and they, they are suicidal or, or not living a life with any meaning, I want to do something to help that now. I don't want to just talk about prevention. But if, if I add uh, improvement of their biomarkers and, and understand what's going on genetically with them, I think that I can treat them better. So, so how do we do pre disease prevention? Uh, these are just a couple of bullets to think about with that. First, disease prevention is different than early detection. I mean, early detection is good. I'm not opposed to early detection. But we want to prevent it. We want to prevent illnesses before they're detectable. And that's what disease prevention is trying to do. We want to look at genetic susceptibility. There are now, you know, gene panels that you can do that will tell you, that will give you at least some prediction about how likely you are to develop heart disease or obesity or depression or um, GI problems. I mean, there's, there's, there, there are genetic markers that can, could, could alert you to the fact that you have a propensity for developing those problems and that you need to do something different to prevent that from occurring. You need to not just follow your impulses, you need to have some discipline if you don't want those things to happen. Behavior like, like exercise uh, or what you eat is another way of doing disease prevention. Diet. Um, thinking about environmental triggers. Uh, people, who, who, who are you with? Where are you? Uh, what are you breathing? What are you eating? Uh, all those environmental things that, we're, that are impinging on our bodies. And then finally, biomarkers, what is what I call this last group, uh, levels of hormones, vitamins, minerals. Examples of early detection are like a pap smear or a PSA or skin monitoring or blood lipid testing. Those are all early detection and they're important. Um, but prevention reduces the likelihood that a disease will occur. And then let's talk about genes. You know, we start with our genes. That's, that's like, the, like the blueprint that we're starting with. That tells us our genetic susceptibility. We can get that by getting a family history. That's, that's very useful genetic information. Or we can do that by genetic testing. Genetic testing gives us the real blueprint. Our family history tells us something about how that blueprint has evolved based on environmental factors that the person has had to deal with. So genetics, again, is just the genes, and it's about the code in the genes. Epigenetics focuses on how that, those genes, are, how the DNA is regulated. So again, what you eat, where you live, who you interact with, when you sleep, how you exercise, even aging, they all eventually cause chemical modifications around the genes that affect uh, if they're turned on or off. And in certain diseases like cancer or Alzheimer's disease, various genes will be switched into an unhealthy state from a healthy state depending on different environmental triggers. So if we understand the genetic problems we are susceptible to, we may be able to make lifestyle changes to affect epigenetics, how the genes are actually expressed, and decrease the likelihood that negative genetic problems will be expressed. So how about lifestyle? Um, behavior, exercise, meditative experiences, diet. Everybody knows these, nobody does them, uh, <laughs> but we should all be doing these. We should all be thinking about ways of integrating these into our lifestyle because these all have possible effects on genetics and then thus epigenetics. 
standard behavioral recommendations, 30 to 60 minutes of aerobic exercise four to six times a week, our strength training a couple times a week. Um, not easy. This guy says, this morning I spent an hour on the bike. Tomorrow I intend to start pedaling. Yeah, you know, it's, it start somewhere, right? When, that, when, when we, in, in, in my office, we are working with people on developing exercise programs. Everybody who does TMS in my office, we are also developing an exercise routine. We're coaching them, starting with where they're at and developing a, a, some kind of a routine to improve their exercise um, physiology. Uh, refusing to go to the gym is not the same thing as resistance training. Yeah, remember that. You know. So it, it is hard to get people to exercise who aren't exercisers. It's easy if you've been an exerciser, if that's part of your lifestyle. You know it makes you feel good, you do it. Um, if you haven't done it, you don't know it, <laughs> and you gotta, you got to learn it. Um, but you can start in small steps and build. Meditative experiences like transcendental meditation, focus attention, mindfulness, you know, effortless transcending. There's different words that people use. There's lots of different styles of this. Prayer, you know, within a religious context. Music, Tai Chi. Um, um, I know that my days are better. My brain is quieter uh, if I have taken the opportunity to meditate. And uh, so I do that at part of, I, I, I personally exercise and meditate every day, uh, unless there's some, some cat catastrophe that day. Um, and they, they, uh, they balance me, they keep me able to focus, to be engaged with other people, to be doing the things that I really love to do. And I'm just encouraging people to figure out some way that works for them that they can enter that state where they can calm their brain right on a regular basis, hopefully daily. Doesn't need to be forever. It could be a half hour, 15 minutes if you can get it. 15 minutes is a lot better than nothing. Then diet. Standard recommendations that we give are minimize consumption of processed sugar. I don't know if you know this, but sugar is poison. You got to think of it like that. And if that's the case, then we're flooded by poison, right? I mean, you walk into any grocery store and any coffee shop, um, <laughs> they're going to be, the sugar is calling you, right? Um, we want to minimize the consumption of grain products. I can talk about that a little bit, but gluten in particular appears to have some negative effects, especially development of inflammation. Take omega-3 fatty acids and or eat more fish preferably small fish. Big fish tend to accumulate mercury, but small fish like um, sardines and, and even fish like trout and, and, uh, and salmon can be, um, are, have less mercury in them. Big fish like tuna um, have more mercury in them. Fast for 12 hours a day. That can be a little bit challenging um, if, you're, if you're like me. Um, but I, you know, I, I, you can you can work toward it. <laughs> um, it's that means don't eat between dinner and breakfast. Um, so for me, I often get home at six o'clock. We might have dinner done by seven. Uh, I'd like to go at least till seven the next day. Really, what I'd like to do is go till about nine or nine thirty. Um, then I'm getting 14 hours, and that uh, that would be optimal. I get hungry, uh, I need to function, uh, my brain feels like I, it can't engage as well sometimes, so sometimes I eat, but I'm working toward that. Take vitamin D. Um, almost everybody, especially in northern latitudes like South Dakota, is vitamin D deficient. Virtually everybody that we've tested, and we've, we've tested uh, over 200 people, has been vitamin D deficient. So this sugar consumption business, um, natural sugars in fruits and vegetables, unsweetened dairy products seem to be okay. You just want to limit granulated sugar, processed sugar, high fructose corn syrup, which is in every processed food almost, honey, maple syrup, 
uh, things that have highly concentrated sugar. So fruits and and vegetables, especially fruits, they have sugar in them, but you're also eating fiber, and that reduces the glycemic index, and that makes them less likely to trigger an insulin response, and we'll talk about the problems with insulin response in a minute. Um, and this is it. So high, high, high sugar consumption results in a hyperinsulinemic state. So insulin follows sugar because it's trying to put the sugar in the cells. We are more hyperinsulinemic now as a, as a culture than any time in the history of the world because we're eating more sugar. Our bodies aren't used to that. Um, chronic hyperinsulinemia and elevated blood sugar are toxic to the brain. So when you have your next candy bar, remember you're doing some toxicity to your brain. Um, it doubles the risk of Alzheimer's disease, hyperinsulinemia does. Uh, due to excessive sugar intake, again, we're probably more hyperinsulinemic than any, at any point in the history of mankind. So how is elevated insulin toxic to the brain? So there's, there's an enzyme in your brain that's called insulin-degrading insulin enzyme. An insulin-degrading enzyme breaks down insulin. So that's cool. Uh, it also breaks down amyloid. And amyloid is the plaque that develops in brains of people who have Alzheimer's disease. You get enough amyloid, you, you are more likely to have Alzheimer's disease. So this insulin-degrading enzyme, uh, you want it to be available to break down amyloid. If it's being used up breaking down insulin, because you're in a hyperinsulinemic state, then it's not, you don't have enough available to break down amyloid that can be developing. And that is one reason why hyperinsulinemia is toxic to the brain, because it uses up insulin degrading enzyme and doesn't allow you to break down amyloid as well. The second dietary thing that, that we suggest is that people at least limit consumption of grain products, especially processed wheat. There's some evidence that wheat increases inflammation throughout the body, including the brain. We, we think that inflammation makes your brain sick. And gluten sensitivity seems to be the central problem. Uh, and it, it seems to you know, create more problems for some people than others, like people with celiac disease. You know, that is a gluten sensitive uh, problem. But probably all of us have some issues with gluten, so it's worth understanding the problem with gluten. So why is wheat or gluten a problem? Here's the here's the backstory. There's a there's a, a molecule uh, named, called gliadin, which is a component of the grain protein gluten. And gliadin is protein, or gluten is protein bound, or uh, protein. Excuse me, gluten is found in wheat. So gliadin is found in gluten. Gluten is found in wheat. Gliadin causes a um, a substance called zonulin to increase in the intestines when you so when you eat gluten and gliadin comes out of the gluten it causes zonulin to be released in your intestine zonulin appears to make our gut more permeable and that is it, it makes um, if these are two cells in the GI system and there there's a pretty tight junction between them right then not much is going to slip through in between my fingers maybe a little bit, small things. If this is affected by gliadin, those, those holes get bigger. So bigger things are slipping in between your cells and into your bloodstream. And why is that important? Well, your body's not used to those things and your body recognizes them as being foreign. It says these things don't belong. So it develops an immune response to these other bigger things that are sliding through in between cells and causes an inflammatory state. Um, that seems to trigger more autoimmunity. You know, we kind of have an epidemic right now of autoimmune diseases and, and hyperinflammatory states and things like arthritis and cancer is an inflammatory disease, uh, coronary artery disease is an inflammatory illness. All of these things may be worsened by that process of, you know, allowing bigger proteins through your 
in, in, into your bloodstream through your intestines and your body developing an immune response and then your body subsequently developing an immune response to things that are sort of like those proteins that are found elsewhere in your body and thus you get autoimmunity. Um, so we want to be thinking about that, how to make your GI system as healthy as possible to decrease inflammation to make your brain healthier. All of these things are connected. Omega-3 fatty acids, eat more fish. I suggest people start low, but aim for about 2,000 milligrams twice a day. Why? Um, we'll go into that in a second. Um, usually, this is there, this is completely benign. Most people have no side effects. An occasional person will have an upset stomach, maybe. Uh, some people will burp up a fishy taste. You can usually get around that by either freezing the omega-3 fish oil and, and eating the frozen tablets or just finding a, a brand that doesn't do that to you. Um, um, Omega-3s decrease inflammation and uh, in, in improve hippocampus volume, uh, improve brain health. Fast for 12 hours each day. Now that, again, we talked about that a minute ago. You know, try to finish eating dinner and then go 12 hours before breakfast or longer. And especially if you have an APOE4 gene, an example of knowing your genetics, if you have an APOE4 gene, which is a gene that predicts Alzheimer's disease, probably if you fast a little bit longer, you can, you can decrease your likelihood of that gene expressing itself. So why, why fast? Um, keeps your insulin level from spiking before bedtime, since insulin spike at that time seems to contribute to insulin resistance. It also inhibits, uh, insulin inhibits the release of melatonin, which helps you sleep, and inhibits growth hormone, which is good for keeping your brain vibrant. It, it promotes what's called autophagia, which is a process in which cells recycle components and destroy damaged proteins and mitochondria. So when you're starving a little bit, when you're, when you're a little bit low in blood sugar and your body's looking for food, it will break down old crappy cells that, that need to, you need to get rid of anyway. So it kind of prunes out the bad stuff. And that's what, we, that's what we think happens with autophagia. And the last thing that fasting does is it induces ketosis, which is what we talked about earlier. Ketosis can trigger brain-derived neurotrophic factor release, bad plus exercise. Take vitamin D. Um, here's some reasons. Reduces inflammation, reduces autoimmunity, improves brain function, reduces cancer cell growth, improves immunity, enhances mood and sleep, reduces the risk of heart disease. D3 is the most active form of vitamin D, so that's what I suggested people take. It's available over the counter. Uh, almost everybody needs some, especially at this latitude. And for most people, there's not a reason to not just take 2,000 units a day. Um, although you can, if you know your vitamin D level, you can be a little bit more precise about how much you need.